The reading today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 33, verses 1 through 11. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And finally, Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, To find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No, please. If I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God, since you have received me with such favor. Please accept my gift that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have everything I want. So he urged him and he took it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. We are in the fourth week of a sermon series on forgiveness, aptly titled, Forgiveness. And I get to talk about forgiving ourselves, forgiving yourself. I don't know why I picked this one, this one's rough. Um, so our first week we talked about being forgiven. And we looked at the story of the paralyzed man who when his sins were forgiven and he was healed, the Pharisees and the scribes were in an uproar because they couldn't believe, they couldn't imagine that God is willing to forgive sins like this. In our second week, we looked at the humanizing power of forgiveness. And we looked at the story of the woman caught in adultery and how there are certain bodies we dehumanize more than others. We asked, where's the man? And why do we think this one person is guilty or less worthy of forgiveness than anyone else? And we read how those around her couldn't imagine themselves, they couldn't even imagine themselves as equal to her in their sin until Jesus intervenes. And last week we talked about forgiving one another. And in that sermon, Andy referenced a really cool formula for when we have conflict in the church in the faith community, as highlighted in Matthew 18. And even though this is presented to Peter, he just can't imagine this. Like, how many times are we supposed to forgive Jesus, Peter says. Peter cannot imagine a grace-filled, forgiving kind of lifestyle. So Jesus tells him, a very worrisome parable, meeting him in his own intolerance because Peter cannot imagine a forgiveness like this. So the trend that I see in these stories of forgiveness is a failure of imagination. A failure of imagination. Whether we are talking about being forgiven or the humanizing power of forgiveness or forgiving one another, we see in these stories over and over a people who cannot fathom a God who could love and forgive as freely as Jesus is preaching and teaching them that this God could. They can't grasp it. They cannot wrap their minds around it. And so, beloved community, I don't know if I can talk about this topic today of forgiving ourselves, forgiving yourself, and have it make any sense if we too are unable to imagine our God as one capable of really knowing us, really loving us, and really forgiving us. Theologian Amy Barber writes, 
The failure of love is often the failure of the human imagination. The failure of Christians to love is often the failure of theological imagination. Let it simmer. <laughs> we'll leave it up. It's a good one. The failure of Christians to love is often the failure of theological imagination. If you cannot imagine, if you cannot fathom a God who could forgive you, I don't believe you will ever be able to give, forgive yourself. Not if we are in this tradition. If you cannot imagine a God who loves you as you really are, like as you really, really are, how can you possibly love yourself as you are? And I see this issue all of the time in my line of work. I meet people who come to church and who practice their faith, who honestly believe that God could just smite them, who honestly believe that there's a real chance they are outside of the grace that God is able or willing to give. That they will not receive the grace that God could offer. They believe themselves unworthy. Okay, I can see that a little bit. I can see how we're unworthy of the grace of God. After all, the grace of God is so immaculate, so big, so huge, and that's why our receiving it is so amazing. There's an old hymn that says something about that. That we're broken and it's hard, and yet God still gives us this forgiveness and this grace, and that's amazing. And this is why Jesus came. This is why we're here. This is why we're gathered here on a Sunday morning, or on a Thursday night, or in some kind of a small group, or at spirit camp. We're here because this is what we want to be all about. But I meet people, I meet all of these people who say they believe in an all-loving God who are also terrified of God. They cannot in their minds imagine or in their hearts experience a God that would love them for who they are as they are. They think their addictions are too much or they're too unkind or they're too fat or they're too skinny or they're too rich or they're too poor or they're too greedy. They're not good enough Christians, not good enough parents, not good enough children. Too much of a sinner, too much of a terrible piece of human for God to love them just as they are. And these same people are often convicted that if they could just change a little bit about themselves, then maybe God could love and forgive them if only they could change. As if, as if anything we do can earn the love and grace of God. As if it has anything to do with us. The love and grace that God gives, God gives because of who God is, not because of who we are. And we hear that. We hear that almost every Sunday. And yet, we still grapple with this. In my sermon reflection study group this week, we talked about how we think a lot of people don't ask for forgiveness when they've wronged someone else because they don't believe that they deserve forgiveness. Not from another person and certainly not from God that the lack of an apology is usually rooted in shame. That maybe when people mess up and they know they messed up, they think to themselves, well, why would anyone still want to be in relationship with me anyway? Not with me, not with someone as terrible as me. I might as well just find a new circle of friends or find a new house of worship or find new relationships, start over. They don't want to know me. Beloved, this is heartbreaking. To shut your whole life down or to shut down a relationship or a relationship in a community because of shame is not the point. Where's your self-forgiveness? And more, where is your belief that God has forgiven you so you can move forward? And as much as this is a relational problem, it is also a theological problem. Theology just means to think about God. However you imagine God in your head, that's your theology. How you talk about God, how you think about God, that's all that theology is. Okay, so if the God we perceive in our sanctified imaginations is one who is fragile and unsteady, unloving or ruthlessly chaotic, if God cannot meet us in our brokenness, then we have a theological problem. If our God is a God whose love you have to earn, whose loyalty you must continually coax, 
then we have a theological problem. That sounds more like a villain than a hero. That sounds like Voldemort or Thanos or Zeus, fill in the blank. It certainly doesn't sound like an all-loving God. It certainly doesn't sound like a God of forgiveness. And if that kind of malevolent God is the primary example that we've been taught and that we know, how could we forgive ourselves? The failure of love is often the failure of human imagination. The failure of Christians to love is often the failure of a theological imagination. Barbara's quote continues. The failure of imagination is never individual but a communal one. Because we learn about God from somewhere. We learn about what church is from someone or someone's. And often we learn through people's actions more than words. But for some of us, it may have also been the words of a preacher or a teacher, of a parent, of a faith community, of a world that says this is what Christians look like and this is what the God they believe in looks like. And that God is unloving and ready to ruin massive parts of the human race and of the community around us. Our individual failure of a healthy, sanctified imagination is one thing, but when it gets compiled into a communal imaginary, a communal imagination presented by our culture, we have a larger problem. And those voices coming from the world, they're not gonna stop, and so what we do here really matters. How we imagine God, how we are in relationship with God, and how we live that out in our lives here together, and then practice it outside of the walls of this church. It really, really matters. Because the failure of an imagination, of imagination is never individual, but a communal one. It's our job as a church to provide a community of love and forgiveness. It's in the baptismal vows that we take all the time. It's in the baptismal vows. You promise it to each other often, whether or not you remember. <laughs> whether or not I feel like remembering. It's in the baptismal vows. It's what we're supposed to preach and teach and do and believe. We're supposed to take that belief and live into it. And that community of love and forgiveness includes you. Sure, forgive others and also forgive yourself for your own sake and for our sake. For the work we have to do in the world, for the transformation of the church and the world. We, in our practice of loving each other, and forgiving each other. Set an example of how God forgives and loves, and there are people watching. There are people watching and paying attention to what that looks like. Y'all, I pray that the grace that you give to others, and I know you give grace to others because I've seen it here. I too go to church here. I pray that the grace that you give to others is a grace you are able to give to yourself. And that you can see how much your creator adores you and knows you and wants you free. God wants you free and able to experience just how far God is willing to go to liberate you back into relationship with self, with community, with creation, and with God. Our scripture today, our story for today, has one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Jacob. Jacob's such a bad person, you guys. Jacob's like one of the worst people that's ever peopled. He's not good. He's not good. Anytime people are like, I don't know if that person's really a Christian, just thumb through who God picks in the Bible and you'll calm down because they're not always great people. They're often not. Jacob's not Israel himself. Jacob, Israel himself, not a great person. Um, as a young man, he tricks his family and unjustly gains both the blessing and birthright meant for his brother Esau, his older brother. And it's so bad he has to run away or he's going to get killed. He builds an entire new life for himself with like a family away from Esau and away from his parents. And when he's finally ready to make amends, he sends all of these gifts ahead of himself. Okay? Um, like the section before where we read, in the chapter before in Genesis 32, it talks about he's got like like slaves and donkey and oxen and gold and just gifts. So like Esau's going to meet him and he's just, there's just waves of gifts coming to Esau. Jacob's always been a trickster. 
He's always been a trickster. It's who, he, it's who he's been. It's how he's done his entire life. And he thinks that he can buy Esau's forgiveness. He thinks he can trick Esau again. The audacity. It's audacious. I'm almost jealous of how audacious it is. I mean, it's amazing. A man who spent his whole life fooling others is only able to imagine himself receiving forgiveness if he can fool someone into it. That's so tragic. That's how he lived his whole life. He's not a young man here. He's got wives and kids, and that's how he's lived his whole life. Only able to imagine himself receiving forgiveness if he fools someone into it. But what happens Amazing grace. This embrace that Esau gives him. And they both find themselves weeping. Have you ever received a forgiveness when you didn't think you deserved it? Because <laughs> that's what happened to Jacob. When you realize that it's not flocks of cattle, nor gifts, nor words, nor anything that you do. That you've been forgiven not because of anything you've done at all, but that someone has forgiven you because of who they are. Jacob tried to send gifts and pretenses and anything to win Esau over, but none of that mattered. It all melted away with an honest, opened arm embrace. An embrace that says, I take you just as you are, just you. Not the gifts, not the smoke and mirrors, just you. Amazing grace indeed. Esau's open arms must have felt like a compassion that Jacob had never known. A grace not earned nor negotiated. We have a word for this in our faith tradition. When you experience this kind of feeling between you and God. An assurance between you and God. It's called justifying grace. So in the Bible, we're taught that we're all sinners. And we've all fallen short of God's glory. But we know that part. That part's pretty easy to believe. But we also believe that we can be made right with God. And here's the kicker. It's not because of anything we do. It's because of what God does. Like Esau forgiving Jacob, there's nothing we can do or offer to receive this from God. God gives it to us because of who God is. That's the God we're talking about. That's the God we worship and praise and teach and believe in. That's the God we're called to hold in our sanctified imaginations. And when we experience God's justifying grace, we not only know we're forgiven, we feel it inside of ourselves. We experience, we experience that Christ knows us, that God knows us, and through the activity of the Holy Spirit, we, have, we can feel it. We don't just know it in our heads, we feel it in our body, an assurance John Wesley said it like this. No accents available from Pastor Winter. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He bare our sins in his own body on a tree. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. But likewise, the revelation of Christ in our hearts a divine evidence or conviction of his love, his free, unmerited love to me, a sinner, a sure confidence in his pardoning mercy, wrought in us by the Holy Ghost, a confidence whereby every true believer is enabled to bear witness. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that I have an advocate with the Father, and that Jesus Christ, the righteous, my Lord, and the propitiation for my sins, I know he hath loved me and given himself for me. He hath reconciled me, even me, to God. Even me is a very popular tattoo among Methodist preachers. He has reconciled me, even me, to God. Even me, even you, and also even them. To open our lives to the experience of the Holy Ghost. To show you who God really is. 
It's not some villain that you have to appease or who will strike you down. No, to open our lives to the experience of the Holy Spirit that can fill us with this assurance so profound that we find ourselves overtaken by love and grace. This is why we are here, church. Last week, Pastor Andy shared part of a quote from Nadia Bowles Weber uh, in a piece she wrote about forgiveness. And I want to share some more of that quote. I want to share the quote in its entirety. So some of this will sound familiar. I really believe that when someone else does us harm, we're connected to that mistreatment like a chain. Because forgiveness is nothing less than an act of fidelity to an evil combating campaign. So it's not an act of niceness. It's not being a doormat. To me, it really is more than that. Maybe retaliation or holding on to anger about the harm done to me doesn't actually combat evil. Maybe it feeds it. Because in the end, if we're not careful, we can actually absorb the worst of our enemy and on some level, even start to become them. So what if forgiveness, rather than being a pansy way of saying, it's okay, is actually a way of wielding bolt cutters and snapping the chain that links us? Like it's saying, what you did was so not okay that I refuse to be connected to it anymore. Forgiveness is about being a freedom fighter. And free people are dangerous people. Free people aren't controlled by the past. Free people laugh more than others. Free people see beauty where others do not. Free people are not easily offended. Free people are unafraid to speak truth to stupid. Free people are not chained to resentment. That's worth fighting for. There really is a light that shines in the darkness, and that darkness cannot, will not, and shall not overcome it. Good work, Pastor Nadia. In the grace of God, in the assurance of that grace, beloveds, we find freedom. We find true and real freedom. And I want to be free. I want to be free. Like Jesus promised, I want us to get free. I want to be free for freedom's sake. The darkness and the evil in this world are not who or what we worship. And that voice of the accuser in your head telling you that you are unloved or unforgivable is lying to you. Forgiving ourselves does not mean that we condone our own behavior or that we believe others should or even God. Even in our scripture from today, we know that Jacob doesn't condone his own behavior. Otherwise, he wouldn't be trying to pay Esau off. Forgiveness and grace can resonate through us, reminding us that even though we are sinners, we have not lost value, that we are still beloved by God, that we still have worth, that we still have much to offer. And it's coupled with a humbling realization that even though we're not perfect, we don't have to be to experience this grace of God and to let it work through us so we can go into the world to transform this world and this church. God can use you exactly as you are. In the words of Cole Arthur Riley, this I believe, that I have come from pain as much as beauty, and I don't have to make the pain beautiful in order to get free. I don't have to make the pain beautiful in order to get free. Okay, so now we're at the how part of the sermon. How do we get free? How do we forgive ourselves more? How do we open our lives to a space where it might be a bit more conducive for the Holy Spirit for us to hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking in, for us to experience this justifying grace, for us to nurture a sanctified imagination. How do we better nurture a sanctified imagination? I know two ways, two ways to do this that I found like well-documented and I've experienced it myself and I've seen it in church work, okay. Okay, the two ways, um, to nurture a sanctified imagination and build space for the Holy Spirit to enter are through either an evangelic spir evangelical spirit or through purposeful theological formation. I'm gonna say that another way. Said plainly, either way involves you joining a small group. 
whether that's through education, through missions, through choir, through music, through something, an actual group of people, okay? And you go with one or two purposes. One is with this more evangelical-based one. You go for fellowship, real authentic fellowship, sharing meals with friends that you've been gathered with for a long time, pouring out your woes, listening to theirs, putting out all the stuff that you dealt with this week and experiencing their forgiveness, their compassion, witnessing through the grace, of, uh, the grace of Jesus Christ through these relationships, finding out that there really is a safe place for you to be yourself and intentionally practicing that, intentionally practicing vulnerability, working with another group of people in this house of faith on that. Okay, so you join a small group to build authentic, true community. That's one way to do this. Both of these ways are also, by the way, in church settings. There's other ways outside of these walls, but. Okay, the second one. Also, join a small group, but go seeking a place to learn more about how you think about God and how others have thought about God and dig into scriptures. I have seen in classes, y'all, I have seen people waking up to their faith in a way that I know that I could not have done by myself. You read the perspectives of how people have thought about God from different time periods, from different contexts, and you, you find a God who said, yes, even them, and yes, even them, and yes, even me is what ends up happening. You get to have that experience, and your heart gets open to all different kinds of people, and it's easier to love them, and it's easier to love yourself. The Fall Adult Faith Formation Catalog is online now. It came out two days ago. We did not time that. That was just the Holy Spirit. ManchesterUMC.org slash catalog. I'm teaching a class this fall called Inclusive Biblical Interpretation. It's about interpreting the scriptures through an inclusive lens. So yes, even you. So that grace can be for yes, even you. Surround yourself with people and with ideas that can nurture your faith so that you can be transformed, so that you can transform the world, so that you may be assured that you, yes, even you, especially you, are a forgiven and beloved child of God. In the words of Cole Arthur Riley, I don't know if liberation depends on our reconciliation with others, but I am certain it at least depends on our reconciliation with ourselves. In this life, it is all we can do to stay whole. An interior unity. We owe that to ourselves. Amen.